I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. You know, because I think... People have to get rid of that scarcity mindset, right? Yeah, have, and, and look, the only reason I've ever made money is because I did this approach. If you don't do this approach, you won't make any money because if you constantly say yes and chase people, yeah. if you're the guy or the girl chasing the date yeah. all the time, they're not going to like you. I think like when you stop chasing the wrong things, the right things will catch you. And, and it's also, yeah, you could teach people how to treat you. And I've learned this. It took me a long time, too. When you realize your value, you'll stop giving it away for free. But... If you feel like you have so much to give, you don't feel like you're giving it away. Well, that's just it. Welcome to a very special episode of the James Altucher Show. Once again, we have Uber podcast producer Steve Cohen. You almost can't use the word Uber anymore. Yeah, because exactly. Because now it also means the company. <laughs> exactly. Like it used to mean the best. Yeah. Now it means this, like, driving company. Yeah, and... <laughs> You probably also can't call me a Lyft uh, producer extraordinaire either. <laughs> or or I always used to call people the penultimate, oh, yeah. realizing that it meant second best. <laughs> it meant, yeah, I think it meant second to last even. Like no, no, I think it means second best, second to ultimate. No, I think it's kind of like, you know. <laughs> All right, hold on a second. <laughs> I think it's Steve. like the Princess Bride where so, he so goes, use that word it, a lot. Perhaps it doesn't mean what you think it means. Uh, uh, but you still have to see Princess Bride too. Well, I still have to see Princess So we're going to do this podcast about a recent blog post I did uh, 101 reasons, no, 101, um, wait, let me look at the title. 101 rules for starting your business. And actually the title got changed to 93 rules for starting your business. I did not want it to get changed. I wanted it to stay 101 rules, wow. even though there's only 93, because one of my rules is that you make mistakes and you move past them. And I accidentally misnumbered some of the rules. Oh, wow. And, but you have to kind of just move past them. And I like the title, 101 Rules Better Than 93 Rules. That's very interesting. First of all, I will say I did think this was a terrific article. And I'm sure, as you know, you know you'd know, you written it a few years back and you got a lot of great feedback over it. I learned a lot from it. Um, you have a very distinctive style. You have a lot of direct advice. Um, it's funny. I laughed. I cried. I learned a lot. <laughs> it was really great. But I also think, you know, you also, though, have a lot 
you weren't like chintzy with the numbering because you had like okay even if you only had 93 you could have easily just repurposed some of those yeah yeah you had like a b c d you know, e f g my goal on these list ones is yeah. and i hate list posts and, yeah. and the reason is i don't care about the fact that they're numbering their yeah. points that's an, a good way for people to read who aren't normally readers and it's it summarizes the information but i find that a lot of people spread out their bullet points i yeah. try to make sure there's mu as much value in every bullet so i have no uh some people can say i there's no, nobody can accuse me of spreading out yeah. the yeah. information to make a longer post like when you're in elementary school and this says oh you have to have 200 words and you're like george washington is a very 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 yeah. very good president um, um, I first wrote this for uh, TechCrunch in I think 2013, and TechCrunch is the primary uh, blog for startups in Silicon Valley. And I remember at the time it was by far the number one post that weekend or that whole week. It was the number one post on the site. And even when I ran into Tim Armstrong the, at a dinner, the CEO of, of AOL at the time, he said I could always tell. Uh, he said it for this week. He said I could always tell when you have a post up because it's the, the wow. views spike for 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 TechCrunch. But it was specifically he was referring to this specific post. Then I wrote it later for my blog and LinkedIn, and I I re and I just rewrote it uh, and changed minor things just to kind of. Sometimes it's good practice to rewrite older things yeah. just to improve your writing and see you know you know keep on improving the craft. I I think people are going to get a lot of value just by revisiting it, and it's the same way you often go back and reread things that you find interest, instructive or inspiring and you see things you didn't see, you do that here. And, you know, like there's well, a lot of stuff that you forget that you did. Or Yeah, yeah. A, a there's stuff that you forget and, and it's good to to see. Also, I try to write every post so that it's evergreen. So if I wrote a post in 2010, it should still read as if I wrote it yesterday. This I wrote in 2013, I really wouldn't change any of the advice. Uh, maybe there might be one thing out of the 93, but I really wouldn't change anything uh, from 2013, because the the rules of business are the same in 1800, you know, and and now. I mean, there's some things change, like oh, here's what you should do a business about. Like maybe now you're more likely to do an AI or robotics related business than something else. But in in most cases, the psychology of business, the basic rules of business, the basic rules of entrepreneurship, and, and the mistakes people make stay the same day after day, year after year, business after business. I see the same mistakes over and over and over again. And it's not that you have to get everything correct in a business. You just have to avoid making as few mistakes as possible. If you have like, uh, if you're, if you're batting 600 on your decisions in, in a business, you're probably going to have a home run business. You can't bat a thousand. If you're batting 300, yeah. you'll probably have a failed business. So it's, it works a little bit like that. In baseball, if you hit 300, you've had a good business, but yeah. you don't think it's the same kind of ratio? Uh, it, it depends what kind of business. So, so for instance, um, this is unrelated to that, the rules for starting a business, but I'm always experimenting with new ideas and creativity, things I don't even really, you know, you know, you might know some, yeah. Jay, Jay's helped me with, with some. I'm always experimenting with different things with creativity. Then if you bat 100, it might be, if you bat 50, you know, 0 0.05 yeah. you might that might be good enough for a home run but a business you kind of have to make most of your decisions correctly but that still leaves you a lot of room for error you can make yeah 40 percent of your decisions could be bad and again of course this is we're making this yeah. up it could depend on the type of decision like if you're making a decision about uh, uh your your business partner who you're giving equity to that could be a pretty scary decision but even then most problems can be overcome a lot more easily than people think. Like we, we've encountered even on this podcast, so many people who had a business fall apart because they had a, a difference with their partner. I've had businesses where I've had differences with my partner. And my first instinct is to always remind myself, this means opportunity is about to happen. Like I can always take a problem with a partner and turn it into an opportunity. There's always a way yeah, to do yeah, it because 100%. no one, no one wants to go to court. No one wants a big battle that's going to take years off of your life. So there's usually a way, if you have a decent business and it's something worth preserving, there's usually a way to work things out. Maybe one partner buys out the other. Maybe you get a new partner who buys out your old partner. Who knows? There's always a way to- And that's to, an age-old biblical issue with King Solomon and the baby, right? Like if the baby's worth preserving, people will figure out a reason because you both love the baby and you can work on it and it's worth doing. You right. Know? So that's- 
Right. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If your own ego is more important than what you're trying to preserve, as that, as your example yeah. shows, you kill the baby. But I also think, like, it's funny because, like, you look through these l- lists, and I think we're not going to do them justice. I encourage people to read it, and at the end of this podcast, we'll have the obviously the article there, which I think is terrific. It's thought provoking. I don't think you were saying things that are provocative just to although you would be you would believe some of the arguments. That's fair, I got. and you know, and I even say though, yeah. I, I mean, I started off, I say, and sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, you. no. I even say uh, this is a bullet FAQ. If you're a lawyer. Feel free to disagree yeah. with me so you can charge some of your BS fees to give the same advice. If, if you want to argue with me, feel free. I might be wrong on any of the items yeah. below. And the reason I wrote this is I've seen so many people write guides to starting yeah. a business or about entrepreneurship, and they're always so wrong that even if you get close yeah. to the bullseye, you're going to be a lot better than these people who are giving advice who are so wrong. I've, I've started a ton of businesses. Yeah. I've invested in a ton of businesses. I've advised a ton of businesses. I've been on the board yeah. of a ton of vis- businesses. I've just seen so much. So I, 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 I know what works and what doesn't, mostly. You can't I, say a thousand well, percent. Sure, and I definitely, and I think I like your style, which I'd like to get into. But again, your hindsight could be other people's foresight. I think, you know, when people write something, a lot of people are writing it and they're writing something that could be sellable. So dispose, you know, that they could be, it could be digested pretty easily and makes people feel good about something. Oh, all I have to do like is want it to happen and manifest, it'll manifest it. So I do think if I'm listening to somebody who's been through it and went through what you've gone through, I'm going to listen and you have concrete examples. But I also think one thing I'd like for us to do now, it's, and you've talked about this a lot, is instead of saying, okay, like you do in number one, okay, do a C-Corp rather than S-Corp or LLC. And, you know, I'd like people remember things when you have a story. You know, right. when you have a story, here's, and I want you, like, to so, keep in mind, like, hey, why did some of these companies work? Why did they not? What did you do wrong? So, and, so, yeah. so that's a great point, just again on the on the writing. I always try very much to have a story. But with this... I was being a little bit more hardcore yeah. in that I did not, I on purpose, if you don't have a story and you're writing, yeah. you have to have a reason. You have to, when you're writing at all, you have to have a reason for every decision you make. So the reason I don't include stories or explanations with a lot of these things is because I'm, I'm emphasizing I don't owe anybody an explanation for any sure. of these things. And these are my decisions, sure. not necessarily yours. And and again, this one this one particular one you just mentioned is too yeah. much in the weeds. We can go into to more sure, broader questions. Hundred percent. But like uh, a lot of people when they're starting a business, they're trying to figure out, oh, should I do a C corp or an S corp or an LLC? I say C corp. There's plenty of reasons sometimes to have an LLC. But here's and and again, this is getting too much into the weeds. Yeah, don't yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Weeds. But but I I don't give any explanation. And I got some arguments about this. But the reason for a C corp, particularly if you're like a, a tech kind of startup, is you you with a C corp you could raise it's easier to raise money with with an LLC you have to change the structure of the business in order to raise money with a C corp you issue more shares yeah. you raise money you could have an option pool you're also protected from um, various types of lawsuits now there's a problem with a C corp in that there's uh, the the company's taxed and your income's taxed so it's like you're double taxed but if you're doing just running a lo- a lifestyle business yeah. like oh it's just me giving advice so I charge then that could be an LLC or whatever. But a regular business where you may, you know, you might have options or, or raising money or you go want to go public or you want to get sold has to be a C corp. And then that was the audience of that particular yeah. blog. And most people who start businesses want to raise money and sell the business or whatever, or, or issue shares to employees and, and so on. So yes, there's other answers. This was my answer I, and I, and I owed nobody an explanation. Yeah, And for I it. consulted with a couple of lawyers who didn't charge me. And they said, well, Steve, you know, it depends on tax purposes. You know what I mean? It's usually like, you know, that's usually the reason yeah, for my, why you do it. Yeah. For my investing, I have an investment partnership with with one other person. We do an LLC, so we don't get double tax. The investment yeah. profits just flow through. Um, but that's not a business I'm looking – I don't even consider that a business. That's just a vehicle for handling taxes and so that we can do things with a similar bank account. A C Corp is an actual business you're trying to build. And do you, well, I think, and I think another thing that, you know, while we were talking about, you were talking about batting 600, batting 300, not wanting to make mistakes and minimize mistakes. And I think 
that though, if you look at a lot of these rules, that's a thread that kind of comes through them. Like people, you know, about, should you sign an NDA? You're like, no, screw that. You know? And, and so you are not, you're or should you require investors to sign an NDA? Right. And like you're that's pretty... my, my point there was, I forgot which rule that was. Yeah. It was, it was like, what's, um, there's one question where I say, you know, what's amateur hour and what, oh, what, what number 25, what is the sign of an amateur? And the first thing I say is asking for a non-disclosure agreement. And I find that to be so silly. Like I've been on both sides of the table. Okay. I've been a business pitching investors and I've been a venture capitalist and I've been an investor in businesses. When a CEO is asks me for an NDA, I, it's, I, I immediately am going to say no to the investment and I'm not going to sign the yeah. NDA because first off, I don't know what he's going to tell me. It could be that I've looked at 50 other businesses, yeah, yeah, 100%. you know, like his business. And then suddenly I'm in a legal jam. If I invest in one of these other businesses, second, what am I going to do? If, if what he's saying is so important yeah. that I need to sign an NDA, am I going to recreate his business? No, I'm not going to be able to. That's why you invest is because you don't want to you want to piggyback on the smart guy and it's, a, it's just you. a bad signal it is it's like i've been in situations like that where like people say hey meet so and so and they're like well before i tell you you know and you know before i tell you, you got to sign this i don't have a freaking lawyer there i don't know what i'm signing and it's like i didn't even ask for the meeting so like yeah it's like i too bad so sad i'm not I'm not doing it. it you know it, what I mean? And, I'm not. And what if, if, if what they're asking for is so easy to steal, yeah. then it's probably not a good business to yeah, invest in anyway. a real moat around it. Yeah. And, um, it, it, yeah. and the other thing is you don't want to deal with people with a scarcity complex. 100%. Like, oh no, this is my one idea. I have to protect it. I'm hoping the entrepreneur I invest in has many, many ideas. Like I invested once in a company where it was a great idea. I loved it. Uh, not only was I the investor, but Peter Thiel, who was the first investor in Facebook was an investor. Mark Pincus, who was the founder of Zynga was an investor and other quality people were, were investors. And, um, uh, the business didn't work except he, the, the CEO was so good. He switched slightly the strategy a year later. Then a year after that, he switched the strategy again, yeah. then again. And finally he created a business that he sold for. $800 million to salesforce.com. So you want someone who's creative, who doesn't think, um, ideas are scarce. Who's aware that, uh, a good idea is Phil is an, really just an umbrella for an abundance of ideas. And you want them to be able to switch as the time, like this guy I invested in, in 2007, so he survived 2008. Yeah. And that's it. That was, that was incredible. It was the only business I had invested in that time that survived 2008 and then had an, an amazing pay off at the end. And it's because he, he and that, and again, that first business idea, he, which we all got excited about failed, but we were really investing in him. He, there's no NDA about yeah. the, and the, I, the human brain. And I, I remember, I think we try and practice what we preach. One reason why I feel comfortable, you know, speaking with you, it's like, I know you, you know, you don't have a scarcity. You are like, I can come up with 10 ideas a day. So that's 50 a week. And watch you with your waiter's pad doing it. But I also think, you know, I think what you're also speaking to is you invest in the person, not just the idea. It's not the idea that's the commodity, it's the person. And I've heard a lot of in entrepreneurs talk about that or VC funds. Hey, it's, right, isn't it like product, market, fit, team, and all that kind of stuff. It's the team and the person, you know? I, like how many times have somebody had, you know, an idea and then they pivoted and, I know. remember one time I was, this is uh, like maybe three years ago, I was looking at something that was like, uh, an Uber of food trucks, something like that. And, uh, on the call with the, the, it was two partners who were kind of like CEO and COO, and they were kind of bickering a little bit, yeah. not in a nice way, but in a way I yeah. felt underneath there was some tension. And, you know, at this point it should have been the honeymoon period. It only, oh, business yeah. only gets harder after the honeymoon. And, uh, uh, I, I didn't invest in it and the company blew up about a, a year or so wow. later. Uh, so, so it, it's always, it's a hundred percent always, uh, the, the people first that you're investing in. And every time I ignored that, I, it was, it just blew up in my face horribly. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I do want to get to that, but one thing I did think, so number 25, you say, what is a sign of an amateur? And you say any of these things, 
asking for an NDA. We just kind of covered that. Trying to raise VC money before product or customers. To you, why is that a red flag? Uh, because before before you have a product, uh, and I'll add a product, service, or customers, a service is implied if you have customers and you don't have a product, there's probably some service you're providing right. them. So I sort of imply that. But let's just say product or service and customers. Before you have these things, you don't actually know what people want. Like I can do a survey of all the CEOs in the world. What can I provide you in you know the cybersecurity category? And they could all say the exact same thing. Like we need protection yeah. against you know this. And then I build it. I could spend. I could raise. I could raise a hundred million dollars from VCs and say, look, I interviewed all 500 CEOs in the fortune 500 and they all said they needed this and no company's making it. And I'm going to build it yeah. if I have a hundred million. So I could spend years building the product now and raise all this money. And then I go back to the CEOs that, and they're like, uh, you know, I do kind of need it, but it's not the top. Like nobody, right. You can't ask someone what they need. They don't know really what they need. You have to build something and show them somehow or other, and like with a customer that's using it. This is what works. This is exciting. This is how much money was saved. This is how you're, you reach out to customers. This is how much time you've saved. You have to find some. And I think what you're talking about is that famous, like Steve Jobs was, was like where he didn't believe in focus groups. And he famously said like, oh, well, Henry Ford said, well, you ask people what they want. They would have said a faster horse, not a car. Like right. people and, and, uh, and Steve don't Jobs, know what they want. Steve yeah. Jobs uh, takes it a, a, a further step, which is like, you have to create the market that you want. Yeah, I'm not even saying that. I'm saying there is a product probably that the CEOs want, yeah. but it might not be what they think. So for sure. instance, take a search engine. What, what business is Google in? What's the 99%? What, what, what's, what's their in? You think of them as, if you were to describe Google as- Well, you think as a search engine, but it's probably more of a advertising. Yeah, yeah, it's really like an, an ad agency. Yeah, yeah. It's like a gigantic mega billboard. Sure. So, so people don't really know at first what business they're in. And it's right. only when you, um, provi you know, provide value to customers that you start to realize what you're in. And then you could raise- Mon you could productize that service and then you could raise money for that and you could show testimonials, examples, and so on. Yeah. I'll just give you one quick yeah, example. Ask you. A friend of mine um, had a, a great idea for a business and I said to her, um, and she wanted to raise $200,000 for X percent of the business. I forget the percentage. And I'm like, well, what do you what do you need $200,000 for? And she's like, well, I contacted a software company and they said within six months they could build the product. Now, this was a product that can also be done manually, although when you do a product manually, it's not scalable because you're right. spending your time. But I said, why don't you call five or six of your friends who you think need this product and say you will do it for them manually. And she's like, why? And I said, shouldn't I be, I know what I want. Shouldn't I be as scalable as fast as possible? And I'm like, well, you, you don't really know yet. No one's ever done this exact thing. It sounds like a great idea. You don't really know yet. What are your customers going to ask for? What additional features they might ask for? Maybe they don't want this product, even though they right. all say they do. Maybe when you're doing this manually, you'll realize nuances that you wouldn't have known. So rather than managing some software company um, to make a product that you don't fully know is useful yet, you'll have so much more knowledge before you build the product. If you just manually do this for a while, then you have evidence that will make it easier to raise the money, easier to build the software product, it's one. A, a, a mega example is Oracle. Oracle, from the beginning, Larry Ellison kept saying, hey, we have the best database in the world. General Motors, buy our database. So General Motors would buy the database. And then Larry Ellison would say, you know, we have to install the database now. We're going to put 100 consultants there for a year, and we'll install the database for you. And General Motors said, fine. Larry, they didn't have a database. They were building, they were providing really what, what I'll call database services and then after four or five years of doing this, yeah. kind of providing this database service, they finally had a product uh, 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 after they learned what everybody really wanted and needed sure. and the kind of functionality they, they needed to, to, to build in. So, you know, a lot of the best companies did it that way. And that, I think, the ones that fall short, obviously, they try and fake it till they make it famously. Theranos and other ones, they were like, okay, we'll just kind of go along and act, fake it till we make it and act like... You know, yeah. but you have to do it with a so, degree so, of integrity. But, so, but, but, but Theranos 
they were there's faking it so you make it legally yeah. and there's faking it so you make it illegally theranos was um saying they had one thing well well i could say oracle did the same yeah. thing but theranos was actually providing right. a service that was a lie that was harmful to people that yeah, could yeah. affect people's lives and they were doing right. it illegally what oracle was doing was still providing the same outcome that general yeah, motors sure. expected it just wasn't a product it was a service and then they productized the service but um uh, uh you know, sometimes it's important to to fake it till you make it. Like, look at the example of Sarah Blakely, yeah. the creator of Spanx, uh, sh or Damon John, who's the creator yeah. of FUBU. So he had this huge hundred thousand dollar order. He had, he had no business going on. He was he was sewing these caps and then selling them. And then suddenly he went to this clothing um, convention, this hip hop yeah. clothing. He had, he got this mega order from Macy's, like a hundred thousand dollar order from Macy's, um, because he said. Oh yeah, we can fulfill this yeah. order, no problem. He didn't have any employees. He couldn't fulfill a hundred thousand sure. dollar order. So, but by faking it until he made it, he at least showed them this is the quality of the product. This is what it looks like. This is you know, hip hop yeah. culture. We'll 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 buy it. It's worth a risk. You know, he sold them, and then he once he got the order, he he faked it till he made it. Once he got the order, he removed all the risk from the equation because he just had to deliver in order to get the hundred thousand he mortgaged his mom's house yeah borrowed the money made the 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 clothes got paid paid back the mortgage and now he was in business so that's yeah. a, that's a positive example of fake it sure, make of it. course and i think ultimately what you're talking about is finding your audience finding your customers you know i've heard jeff bezos talk about rather than worry about the competition you know worry about your customers your customers are always going to you know, be the ones that you need to serve. They're going to be yeah. the ones that are buy your product or service or whatever it is. Uh, and yeah, I'll give you another example. Um, a company I started, stockpicker.com. Um, I always, I, at the time I called it the MySpace for finance because sure. MySpace was, had just sold for $500 million to News Corp when I, when I started building stockpicker.com. And I don't know, I had done no competitive market research. So it was about, I was about halfway through developing this when I suddenly realized I had four competitors in the exact same space, like social media for investors. And, uh, I was for about, for about 15 minutes, I was really upset. I was like, Oh no, I spent this money. I put all this time. I have all these competitors now who knows who's better. But then I realized, Oh, they were just, I looked at all the other competitors. I felt, I got this feeling they were just doing this because investing was hot and social media was hot. Whereas I actually had experience yeah. in both and I was building by far the best by just focusing on what invest as a professional investor, I was able to focus on what investors actually needed. I made the website that I would use myself. Sure. And so that was why I was able to finish it and then have a million users a month once it, once it was and, done. And one of your rules here, I forget which number, is alludes to that kind of aspect of it. Like, should I be worried that they're competitors? And you're like, no, that means that there's a lot of interest in this. Let's just be better, build a better mousetrap. Like, right. Like, now, now yeah. Peter Thiel, I'll, I'll get to Peter Thiel's book, Zero to yeah. One. He makes the great, great point that you don't want competition. In capitalism, you want profits, so it's better sure. to be a monopoly you know, kind of a monopoly under the radar so that you're not sure. regulated. But he says the best thing you want to do is create its own unique monopoly. And so, but you're able to do that even if you have competitors. Like basically, I just kept adding more and more features until nobody had a business or a product like mine because I had so many amazing features. And I asked him, I asked Peter Taylor this after the book came out. Well, Facebook wasn't monopoly. It had There was MySpace, there was Friendster, there was other social media companies. And he said, no, you're wrong. Facebook was a monopoly in social media sites with confirmed identity. Yeah. And that was very interesting. Like you can kind of thin slice where your monopoly is. Oh my gosh. I love these clothes. Mizzen and Maine. That's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Maine. It really is the most comfortable work clothes travel clothes. I'm trying, I had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Maine clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Maine. As you wrap up your year end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Maine dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very 
very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, every guy loves to look great. So again, Shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. These days, we're all investors trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports? is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game-like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. And I, I, I think, you know, a lot of these reasons, like you were talking about, you know, why certain businesses fail. Sometimes they're going to fail for a variety of reasons, but a lot of times... It is due to the weaknesses of the people or the poor decisions they've made. And maybe you could talk about some of the companies that you worked with and, you know, you started a lot of companies and which were some where you were like, oh, if I knew now what I knew then, I would have succeeded. Um, I think, I think if, if you always have to ask yourself as an investor or even as an entrepreneur, but let's just take, take the focus as an investor. Why am I getting this opportunity? Why does this opportunity exist for me? Uh, uh, Because nobody wakes up in the morning and says, man, I can't wait to make James Alvature rich. Like no one's just handing out opportunities to me for free. So let's say I see a business and I'm like thinking, hmm, this looks good. 
I'll invest and maybe I can negotiate for a bigger amount because I'm the only one investing right. and, and they don't have anyone else. Well, there's a reason why they don't have anyone else and they're coming to me and it's probably not a good reason. So now um, when I invest, I always make sure I'm investing with people who are much more professional than me. Uh, or maybe they have an infrastructure like a venture capital firm and they're, they're smarter. They do more. Due, I still do due diligence, but I assume I always invest with people who have done even more due, dil, due, due diligence and have maybe PhDs working for them that do research yeah. and so on. So I always assume I'm the stupidest person in the room and that everyone else has to be smarter and then I'll be willing to invest. Even when starting a company too, I just, I don't assume that somebody wants a certain product. I really, like I said, I try to manually yeah. provide the service or I start and off. What does that with, mean manually? Provide like, service? like, let's say, let's say you wanted to build, yeah. uh, your own website. I'm just okay. giving you an example. Yeah. My, my first business was a website yes, development company. Sure. In the 90s. I would build your website for you instead of making software that builds websites. Oh, interesting. Right. Now, if I had made that software after building hundreds of websites, right. maybe I would have been a billion dollar company like WordPress. I didn't do that. There's I didn't, a difference between for those entrepreneurs out there, right? Like this, there's a practice and there's a business, right? Like a business is scalable. Yeah. yeah. And so, and so a, a service business will be profitable because, uh, I don't have to invest in ma making a product. I just charge for services. So I'm always sure. going to be profitable. So that's a kind of business. But it's much better to have a product style company. So again, two companies that are in the website development business. There was my company, which sold for like I don't know, fifteen million or so. Yeah. And then there's a company like WordPress, which is worth over a billion. They both have the same goal: make a website. But a product business is is worth more. So whenever you have a service business, you always want to figure out how you can productize it because that increases the value yeah. dramatically. I only learned that after, let's say, being in business for ten years. So I wish I had uh, known that uh, early on, I could have made a lot more money because there were some pieces yeah. of software I was writing to help people make websites that I, I didn't never told people about because I didn't think yeah. it was useful to me. And, and then how do you make sure you don't make those same mistakes again? Well, now as an investor, you make new mistakes. <laughs> you make new yeah, mistakes. Yeah, yeah. First off, you always make mistakes, and, and you can't be afraid to make mistakes. And 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 I think that is what you're alluding to with some of that here. Like, oh, if you're holding on so tightly to your idea, or you're too precious about this, or yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's 93 rules, but like, there's yeah. a lot of sub rules. Like, for instance, in that number 25, because I'm still staring at it. What is the sign of an amateur? There's like 10 things under there. So there's really like 200 different yeah, points 100%. and rules. All of this. The only reason every single one of these things is here is because I've made the mistake of doing the opposite at some point. So 200 things. So it requires a lot of bad experience to kind of avoid lots of mistakes. And the reason you want to avoid mistakes is that's how you remove risk. You don't remove risk by being great. You move a risk yeah. by not being bad. And so, so, uh, that's what I had to learn the hard way. Um, uh, so yeah. what I do now is I, again, as an investor, I'll invest with people smarter than me. I usually won't go on a, on a board of directors anymore because I want people smarter than me to be on the board of directors. Uh, and I will, you know, I'll, I, as an but what investor, about, but what if you're out there, you know, like, you know, if you're out there and you know, you're listening to us and you, and you may say, well, geez, how do I get exposure to these people? Or, okay, I'm not looking to invest. I'm looking to start a business. You know what I mean? Like, I'm trying to picture somebody there. Yeah, yeah. Like, so the way, the like, way, the way yeah. to get exposure to people, uh, uh, now you can, I could talk from the point of view of an entrepreneur. The way you get exposure to people is you start a business. You figure out something people need. You provide that service. If it works, you productize it. You raise money to make it into a, your service into a product, but you already have revenues and profits and customers because you've been providing a service. Uh, and... Uh, and you choose yourself, like yeah. you famously said, like, which is, I think a lot of it is consistent with what you've written about over the years. You know, should I hire a PR firm? Should I get a technical person? Should, and the answers to those are, yeah. No. In, in almost yeah. every case, sh when you say, should I hire X? The answer is no, at least initially, because you should do everything yourself, particularly if you're a first time entrepreneur. Now it's different. If you're a restaurant, you need a, a manager, you need waiters, you need a, a cook, uh, uh, sure. uh and, and so on, but you should understand the recipes. You should understand, um, the architecture of restaurants. You should understand yeah. what is a good hostess or host. You should understand what's a good waiter and what's good service. So you should ha be 
the, the, the entrepreneur needs to be aware at a very professional level of every aspect of the, the business. But, um, you know, now, uh, if I was going to do something and then I have ideas all the time, I would very much try to come up with a good idea and find a good customer who wants me to do that idea. And then if I can try to do that idea manually as much as possible to see if, if it's, if it's yeah. something that works and then productize it. Like, um, you know, we were, we, we were just riffing yeah. around like a year and a half ago. Right. Uh, th this is an idea that I'm sure has been done a billion times and it's probably a bad idea, but I, we were just joking around and, uh, this was the idea I, I had and I, I shared with you and, uh, imagine if someone calls up a restaurant and yeah. says, I want to, I want to make a reservation for four. And as soon as the, um, host or the maitre d' or whatever puts the rest, the reservation in the system, it pulls up all of, let's say I make the reservation. It pulls up all of my social media, yeah. everything else about me. Maybe it pulls up even my yeah. Experian data and, and I'm, and you're able to see, oh, this person likes this kind yeah. of wine. He commented on it. He was in this region of France two years ago. So he probably likes this yeah. kind of wine. He, he's a vegetarian. So he probably, he likes this kind of, and so then you can alter the customer experience by having this knowledge at reservation time. So then we talked to a restaurant right. owner. That guy was like, oh, of course I would love something like that. So now I can do this manually. I can spend a day or two or a week or a month and everybody who makes a reservation, I can say, look, try this strategy, try this strategy, try this, because I could look up manually. Yeah. And then at the end of the month, we can track, did the restaurant make more or less money? And did they, they make more money on that? We could even test. Did they make more money on the people where I gave them information or more or not more money? Or was it the same? And then you have a testimonial. Yeah. Then you could go to another restaurant, do it again, two testimonials and, and more quantitative evidence. Now I can make a product and raise some money if I need to, by the way, I'm already making revenues because I've been yeah. working on it as a service yeah. or I could just charge. I could, maybe the other thing I can do is I can hire 50 interns, yeah. do it for 50 restaurants. And so it's still not a scalable business, but now I have a business with revenues and profits coming in. Now I can build a product without yeah. even raising any money. And I remember, I remember signing an NDA for that when you told me it. Yeah, <laughs> no. Um, but I do think, but we were sitting in a restaurant. That guy was like, yeah, yeah it's well, a great I'll, idea. I'll, and but, but, but by the way, I, I think that maybe it's not a good idea because, um, open, a lot of restaurants get reservations now through open table, which is a different sort of thing. I think there's always any idea is going to always have friction and resistance. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it, that's why bringing back to like why some businesses fail it comes down to determination of the people their adaptability like but you, but also it's how they execute it's like yeah. when i said the example of my friend who wanted to raise two hundred thousand dollars she was setting her up herself up for failure um because she at first in order for her to succeed in order for me with her idea the exact same idea to succeed i just had to call up i would have to call up six friends and do the idea manually get the testimonials and sure. then I know I'm going to succeed if it, if it's working for her to succeed, she has to raise $200,000. She has to build a, a product that may or may not be wanted for, for six months. And it might have bugs yeah. in it. She has to find customers. She has to then tweak it because the customers are not, it's not going to be a customer fit. Exactly. Uh, so I only had one thing that had to work yeah. in order for my business to succeed. My version of her business to succeed. She had to have five things that all had to work at the same time in order for her to succeed. So people misunderstand execution. You still need to be creative about your ex. It's not about doing the execution. It's about being creative and then doing the execution. You know, right. that's very big differences. The same idea executed in different ways. One could fail. One could not. Yeah, no, I think, um, I think about that a lot. And I think about like when we interact and we try and be very creative and come up with a lot of different ideas, you certainly have benefited from the practice of writing down all these ideas. And just, again, like when we're in situations, I'll say, let's, let's not curse the darkness. Let's light a candle. Let's think of different ideas and people who want it badly enough, they'll figure out different ways to do it, or they'll know when to quit too, which is something that you've done. And I think yeah. you alluded to that with your friend and that you're like, okay, if it's too hard, why? I mean, it, you know, it's going to be hard. Like you've written about this even 10 years ago, you talked about like a lot of things that are worth doing are hard. And so you're not trying by saying all this, you're not, you know, these 101 rules, you're not saying it's easy, right? I mean, no, you're saying, but you want to, because, because it is hard, you want to make it as easy as possible. Again, 
the example with my friend, she was making it harder than it needed to be. I was, you know, because she might have to revamp her entire business once she made right. a software. I would already, just like Oracle, but by the time it actually made a database, yeah. they knew everything the customer wanted. If they just made a database first, they would have to revamp the whole thing once they knew right. what the customers want. So here's another example. I created a company called Jungle Smash. This was in, I want to say 2007. I, f I forget the year, 2008 uh, or 2009, one of these years. And the idea was I would offer $1,000 a month. I would pick a brand like Crest Toothpaste. Yeah. And I would offer $1,000. I would hold a contest and I'd offer $1,000 whoever made the best advertisement for Crest Toothpaste. And I called the, the business Jungle Smash and people started submitting videos. Now, I could have made a whole website where people submit automatically and there's voting automatically and people friend each other and blah, yeah. blah, blah. Uh, instead, people emailed me or no, people eat, I had people load up the videos on YouTube. Yeah. They emailed me the link. I manually put them on yeah. like a WordPress blog that I had set up to make it as easy as possible. And, uh, uh, you know, I didn't, I, I, and then I picked it myself. I didn't yeah. have any voting. I picked the winner myself. I, I, there was no automated voting. There was nothing automated. And here's the interesting thing that happened. First off, dozens of people submitted videos. Then Crest Toothpaste I, I, I guess yeah. Procter and Gamble, their marketing department contacted me and they said, can we submit also? They submitted a dozen wow. videos. And, uh, so suddenly I realized something I didn't realize at first, which is that, oh, maybe this disrupts advertise yeah. the advertising business. Maybe, maybe big brands like even Procter and Gamble or, or Crest Toothpaste, they could outsource advertisement development to these sure. crowdsourcing platforms. And so... I suddenly had like a legit business without putting a single dime into it other than wow. the thousand yeah. dollars for the cutters. And, and and it was so significant that Procter and Gamble even wanted to set up a call with me. Now it just so happened that month I was getting a divorce and I decided, yeah. you know what? I don't want to deal with this. So I, I didn't, I didn't keep up with the business and whatever right. you could, anybody, that's why I'm being abundant here too. Anybody can go steal that business. I don't know if anybody's ever even done it since, but I knew for a fact that, oh, A, people were going to submit yeah. to win a contest and B, large brands were interested. So, but, but I didn't spend a single dime, whereas I could have spent a hundred thousand dollars building a whole platform yeah. first. And you, you've actually, you know, full discord, you've helped me a lot with that too. Like we'll come up with ideas that you, a lot of times are ready fire aim and i'll be like yeah it's we could do this 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 and this and i make it more complicated and that's probably also a delaying tactic like it's and the, and there's a reason obviously we talked about this in a recent podcast about why some people don't succeed right and so so regardless of the reasons like maybe it's oh yeah. it's an excuse or it's like a fear of failure yeah. or it's self selfish regardless of the reason there's just one technique you can do yeah which is what i call figure out the conspiracy number of a solution. So how many things, if, if you have a solution, how many things have to conspire together to make that solution work? So if I had to build a website, create voting, create like, uh, you know, yeah. blah, 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 you know, find, or, by the way, I just picked Crest Toothpaste yeah. out of a hat. Like if I had to find a brand that would agree, right. that's another thing. And get their permission. Yeah, and, yeah. and get their permission. Everybody was telling me, don't you need their permission? Yeah. No. Um, but but everybody yeah. thought it. So, so I, the way I did it was nothing had to conspire was my solution as opposed to what everybody else was telling me, five things would have to conspire. So do the, pro the solution yeah. where it has a conspiracy number of tops one for example like like you just launched i remember we were talking about doing a book club because you love books you've written a lot of books um 23 at last count and you and i was like we need to do a book club we can partner with so and so this that the other and then the next thing i know you like started doing videos and we're getting a lot of downloads yeah we're gonna and, get fifty thousand yeah downloads of uh, uh, does 50, a great 50, job with views them. of video really amazing and uh but but like that was something where hey you just like a lot of people say you ship it get it out there put it out there we'll get an audience we'll get better and you know the month it might have taken me to partner with some you know or to or never do it and yeah, so yeah you have to figure so, out most for meetings you. yeah most meetings don't work out yeah right even if you the meeting seems great like oh yeah, yeah. we love this let's get let's have a follow up me most things don't work out and 
So that's why A is good to avoid most meetings. And by the way, there's a kind of corollary, which is if say yeah. if someone says, Hey, we should do this again, you should say yes because yeah. chances are it's not gonna work out anyway. So why say no? Well that's is that the proverbial like, oh, let's do lunch in Hollywood. You had a lot of Hollywood meetings or people like that. But I, I think one thing that I always liked, I always liked that um there was a movie Get Shorty with John Travolta uh-huh. and Gene Hackman, and there was a scene where John Travolta is looking at Hollywood from an outsider's perspective, and he's a gangster who comes in, and the the theme of that movie is called Get Shorty, and you know it's called Get Shorty because they were trying to get Danny DeVito to be in a movie, and Gene Hackman is of that system, and he's saying his character is kind of an old like schlocky movie guy, and he's like, listen, my psychiatrist cousin's uh, neighbor, you know, knows him, and you know, and we could ask him to do it, and Travolta's like, listen. You know, his character, Chili Palmer, says, listen, if I want somebody to do it, I just stick a gun to their head and say, you're doing it. And very direct, he goes, I'm going to ask my psychiatrist's neighbor's cousin. And he goes, no, my psychiatrist's cousin's neighbor. And he's like, it doesn't matter. Like you, And so I do think there is something to be said about being direct, being bold, taking a yeah. chance. You're not always going to succeed. And, 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 and right. And if, you're, if, if your conspiracy number, again, is as small as possible, then you're able to try things quickly, fail quickly. Like at any given point, I'm not even talking about just starting businesses. At any given point, I'm experimenting with either entrepreneurship or other creative projects, five to 10 things at a time because I make it as easy as possible for myself to see which thing I'm going to hit the accelerator on. So should I? right now, I'm trying to do a, a, a TV show, a, another book, uh, another business, uh, invest in other projects, uh, on and on and on. And... Uh, I figure out ways to to structure the experiment so that it's as easy as possible and as fast as possible to get results. And and I figure out how I'm going to measure results. I keep my conspiracy number low, and then I'm able to execute. Now I know we only got to right 25 of yeah. the 93 options, but I think um, you know this has already been an hour. We should. Uh, can I just go through three real quick? Oh, we could do it. We could do a part two also. Fine, but I'm just going to just say okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good at taking clue cues. Okay, but I, you're on a roll between 59, 60, and 61, and I think we should end on that. You say, should I hire people because I can travel on a seven-hour played Ryan with them? You said, don't be an idiot. If anything, hire people the opposite of you, else who will you delegate to? Fair enough. Who should I say no to? A client. When they approach... Uh, a, who? When should I say no to a client? And you say, when they approach you. When should I say yes to a client? Every other conversation you ever have with them after they in the initial no. Could you explain what you meant with yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. So so first one, um, everyone says, oh, hire the sort of person you want to fly uh, across the country with. Now, you know, look at look at you and me. We've flown yeah. across country yeah. together back and forth several and times. Chatty patty. And 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 we and and but you're like in many ways opposite. Like yeah. you're obsessed with sports. I'm not. Yeah. And but the key thing is you're so much better at follow up with people I am so horrible well, at that. Even it, a turtle looks fast moving past a rock. Exactly. Well, if I count, if I hired someone just like me sure. in terms of follow up, like if I said, "Oh yeah, this is this guy has all the exact same interests as me, so he's gonna find all the, the co- great guests for the podcast." That, that'll be great. If you were just like me in terms of follow up, we would have no guests on this podcast. <laughs> so, which is not. Totally true. I bring yeah, on some guests great. as well. Yeah, you're great. You're amazing. But, but no, no, no honestly, I'm, I'm, I, I'm horrible at like, yeah. hey, call me later. I never do it. So so you're really great at follow-up and staying in touch with people, not just from week to week, but over decades. Yeah. Like you'll stop people in the street that you saw three decades ago and say, hey, uh, how's your sister? It's her birthday today, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, and then and then people come on. The, you got the most yeah. amazing people on the No, thank you. But I think it's, I can only do it because we have a great team here. Y- you yeah. have to hire for you know, you have to hire people not like you or else you should do the, sure. the, the, those things. Uh, second, well, the second one was, um, about the client. If a client comes and, and says, um, Hey, can you be on, let's say, let's say I'm, I'm trying to think of what's a, a, a business that the client would approach me on. Uh, what's a, what's a, what's a business that we oh, can think of? Uh, that a client approaches you about a business, um, web design. I mean, right. You've yeah, done, or, yeah. Or let's say, yeah. um, uh, now it's you know strategic social media yeah, yeah. marketing or okay. whatever. Uh, my initial answer is always here's what I do. It's a, it's a one two punch. Yeah. My initial answer for something like that is um, no, I'm really busy, but 
a, a, here's what you should do. And I'll list, you know, yeah. my 10 ideas. I always have 10 ideas wow, for them. That's amazing. And, and then I'll yeah. say, but, and I will introduce you to somebody who can help you right. execute these ideas. So then th there's no bad, right? Even though I said no, there's no bad outcome there because one outcome could be they ignore me completely, in which yeah. case they were never going to pay me anyway. If, thousand percent. If, if, yeah. You know, B, they could hire the person I recommend. And now I either have a great relationship with both yeah. sides that I could use later on as in my yeah, Rolodex. Yeah. Or maybe that person um, gives me a finder's fee or whatever yeah, yeah. that's happened. Or they could hire that person and put me on their board of advisors and gives me shares of their yeah. company or whatever. So I've had all of these outcomes happen. Um, the bad outcome that happens is I say yes, and now suddenly they're like, okay, well, you have to present us a proposal. And I'm like, well, I just told you. No, 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 you have to come into our office and yeah. give us a full proposal. A and then you have to like dress up and give yeah. them a full proposal and they're and they're acting like they're already your boss even though they've given you no money. And so there's nothing good comes from saying You're yes. so smart. Now, yeah. if they call yeah. you a second time, you can say, if they call you a second time, the reason they're calling you is because, look, we took, we thought about all of your advice. We really like it. We'd really like you to be more involved in the company because we we respect this advice you gave. Now you could start feeling out if there's a relationship there. You can say, okay, how about we yeah. have lunch? How about we meet? You know, and then you could see. And and sometimes that's the way the best business relationships result. Um, but always offer value before you uh, take for you. And speaking for our listeners, and I promise this is it, but like, they're going to say, well, James, I'm not you, you know, you're so smart and you, you know, and you've done all this, but like it, I guess, again, like we're learning from your hindsight is other people is, you know, because I think people have to get rid of that scarcity mindset, right? Yeah. Have, and, and yeah. look, and I, and I, the only reason I've ever made money is because I, I did this approach. If you don't do this approach, you won't make any money because if you constantly say yes and chase people, it's like, well, if you chase if if you're the yeah guy if you're the guy or the girl chasing the date yeah. all the time they're not gonna like you I think like when you stop chasing the wrong things the right things will catch you and and it's also yeah I think it's I think there is something to be said you could treat people how you could teach people how to treat you and I've learned this took me a long time too it's like when you realize well I mean I was gonna say when you realize the va your value you'll stop giving it away for free but you have if you feel like you have so much to give you don't feel well, like you're giving it away well that's just it so I call this the Google technique. Yeah. So, um, if you know, my, my best sales have always happened when I recommend the competition first, I say, you know what? It's not quite right for me. You know, who does this even better is my competitor X, Y, Z. So what does Google do? If, if you go to Google and you say to Google, Google, please tell me everything you know about motorcycles and what motorcycle I should buy. Google is not going to say, well, we know everything about motorcycles, you know, pay yeah. us $5 and we'll give it to you. Google says, look, Steve, to be honest, we don't know anything about motorcycles, but we've done right. the research for you. Here's 10 of what we think are the best websites about motorcycles. By the way, two of them have paid us to advertise, but we identify those. Yeah. Here's 10 of these websites. Why don't you go to one of these websites? Good luck. Maybe we'll never see yeah. you again. Where are you going to go? The next thing yeah. you have a question about hotels, you're going to go to Google because you know they yeah. treated you fairly on the motorcycle thing and they were smart and they were valuable. Now, what ends up happening is, is that yeah. what's the product? It's not that they're, you know, yeah. we know that you're the product. You're, you're giving yeah. them data that you want motorcycles and hotels and this and that. But it's the same thing here. Like, uh, if I know, oh, this company has XYZ interests, this other company that I'm going to introduce them to has ABC interests and yeah. I hook them up and it works out. Um, you should be able to navigate around that over hundreds of instances. Google's worth a trillion yeah. dollars. If you apply that same approach in life, you should be able to be worth and, a few and, million at least. And I think a lot of times you trust your gut and I'll end with this. And I like what I try and do when we, you and I speak is just to be as honest and as forthcoming and authentic. And if you remember when we started, you know, we were, we met and I had a lot of quotes and I'll, but I remember telling you, when we were talking about, oh, should we do this? Or how much should you get? That? And I said, James, if you have a plan, it works once. You have a partner, it works a lifetime. And you look and you say, and that's effectively what you're trying to do with people. You're trying to be a partner for them. Think about what they that's want. That's a really good way to put not it. Not just to say, not to be that short-sighted and just think about that one thing. 
and to say, okay, we're going to be working together for a long time this time. Well, and let yeah. me just say my, my most lucrative business that I've started is my investing business where I invest in private companies and, uh, I have one partner in that and we've been partners since 1999 yeah so for 20 years and i don't even really yeah he likes to stay behind the scenes works out of his mom's yeah. basement or whatever <laughs> and but it's been by far i've had several businesses that i've sold and built up and made money this has been by far my and, most successful did you know business. at the time that he was oh he had again like he probably wasn't exactly like you like he's, oh, he's 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 a hundred percent different <laughs> which he's, by definition he started off he started off as an employee yeah. um but then a few years later we decided yeah. i wanted him to be more of like a think of like a partner rather than like yeah. an employee but he is a hundred percent different um he's from yeah. the midwest he is a strongly religious yeah. catholic he is strongly strongly pro-life i am pro-choice People think often oh, that yeah. these are like make or break yeah. political things that you should never mix. Yeah. But actually, I respect that he just he just he has foster children. He just adopted one of the That's foster great. kids. Like he yeah. puts his he he ethically puts his um, actions where his beliefs are, and he's he's super honest and has a lot of integrity. And he's That's he, the most important thing, right? Rather yeah. than those differences politically, like if somebody is a decent ethical person. Yeah, and that's absolutely. what you've talked about a lot, right? Like that, we sh you shouldn't. You you had a lot of good rules here, just about don't compromise your beliefs or ethics about things, and don't work with people. Yeah, and he said he yeah. uh, has a strong marriage for the past fifteen yeah. years, and uh, and we've been involved in everything from website businesses to uh, hedge funds to investing in dozens of other businesses, which we con and and again, he's better at follow up, so he keeps in touch yeah. with all the CEOs to see how things are going. Uh, he takes he keeps track of all the paperwork something i'm notoriously yeah. bad at over the years like in well, yeah. when i was getting a divorce and was depressed he was able to kind of cover for me in ways that were were yeah. were very helpful uh so having having strong partners is is extremely important but we have 70 other items on this yeah, list we'll, to go through we'll do a part can't two wait. and we'll release that in a couple of days the part two yeah thank once you. again Super podcast producer Steve Cohen. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Once again for coming on the Thank you for podcast. having me. Thanks. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.